Okay, thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me um, to London. I went to high school here, so it's always delightful for me to come back here and visit. Um, I also want to just mention that Dr. Linda Duffy, whose name is up on the screen, she and I work very closely together. I used to be over at the Division of Nutrition Research Coordination. We're still involved with many products, uh, projects together, so I wanted to make sure that she was acknowledged for all of her help um, in putting together some of this, uh, the, the slides that I have here. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to make up for some time, so I'm going to go very quickly. Um, I'm going to talk in more broad and general things. I'm not going to focus on data slides. I have information. If you need any of that, you can ask me afterward. But uh, again, we are behind, so I'm going to try to make up for, um, for some of that time anyway. Um, and some of the stuff that I'm going to go through, you've already heard before because some of the other speakers this morning have been able to talk about it. So. I'm going to go now. So for example, the definition of fermentation, we've already discussed this earlier. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to focus on in my talk is, as you heard, I was a head of nutrition, a deputy director for the NIH of nutrition research. I left that position about a year ago, and I went over to the Department of Agriculture, where I'm now head of um, nutrition, food safety, and product quality. So it has expanded my outlook significantly. And so I'm not going to focus as much on the health effects of the um, of fermentation as I am on some of the food safety and quality aspects of it, because that's more of us taking over some more of the projects that I do now. Um, so, for example, one of the things that we know about fermentation, it's very, very good for biopreservation. And it's, that's the extension of food life and the food safety of the products of the natural or controlled microbiota um, and their antimicrobial compounds. And one of the most common forms of food pre um, biopreservation is fermentation. And so we do use that a lot to uh, create safer and better, higher quality products. Um, it's often associated with, as you've heard already, with dairy products. Um, with cultures that increase, you know, that produce wine, that produce um, alcohol, but also meats and uh, vegetable products and juices. Uh, the bacteria are used or selected depending on the food types that you want to have and the physical, chemical, biological compositions of the foods. And they provide flavor properties and to the consumer. And you have to remember, when you're doing this, the flavor, texture, and quality of the product does change. And that's going to be a big factor for the type of the population who's going to be eating that. Some of them, some populations are very attuned and accustomed to this, and other populations are going to, going to have to get used to the fermentation and this, this form of biopreservation. Um, uh, most of the uh, bacteria that we look at are the lactic acid producing bacteria, as you heard before. I'm not going to go through their num numerous strains. You've seen them on the slide, so I'm not going to go through those. Um, but there are a couple things that they do. Um, they, they also are very active in the preservation and of health because they get rid of the pathogenic bacteria. So you can produce an increase in the cultures of the very beneficial bacteria in the gut and get rid of the, um, the uh, ones that are, you don't want to have there that are pathogenic and could produce some really negative outcomes for you. So you want to look for ba bacteria that are going to work with your food, work in your foods to produce the, the metabolic outcomes that you want as well as reducing the pathogenic ones. Um, again, fermentation definitions, we've had them already. Um, just to mention again that they've been around for many, many years. You've seen the slides this morning, so I'm going I'm to rush through these. Again, there are two types of fermentation. There's the alcoholic and the uh, lactic acid fermentation. Um, when the fermentation occurs, the sugars and the carbohydrates are eaten up by the bacteria or the, or the yeast or whatever it is, and converted, the food gets converted into a new form. For example, you saw the juices went to wines and the grains went to beers. You also have changes in meat products. You also have changes in vegetables, and that will affect, again, the texture, the taste, and the quality of the food products. Um, the, another product we have in the United States is sourdough bread, which is a terrific bread if you ever have a chance to have that, which is produced by the fermentation. Um, the, during the fermentation process, you get release and, and uh, accessibility and bioavailability of vitamins and nutrients. So it's critically important to be able to have this 
in your, um, for, for your products. Um, but vegetables are frequently, are traditionally fermented with salt and water, and this is called a brine. Um, and one of the things that happens during this process is it kills off many of the negative or potentially harmful bacteria so that you have um, the more positive bacteria that can flourish and um, work on the vegetables to produce um, uh, components or release components that are more beneficial for your health. Um, I, I do have to put a plug in here for one of our research labs. Traditionally, so the pickles which are used, uh, which are put in brine, are put in a sodium chloride solution. The Environmental Protection Agency in the United States came to us and said, we have a problem with the amount of chloride that is leaching out and is getting into soils and water places. So we, our laboratory has produced now a calcium chloride, which can, which can brine the pickles, can, can um, ferment them, with uh, about 90% less of the product. So we have 90% less chloride going out into, this, into the waters and into the surface. We also then have a chloride in there instead of a sodium, so it's also got a potential health benefit for that. So I have to put a plug in for that lab. Um, again, fermented foods, um, all types of foods can be fermented. As, uh, fruits and vegetables are what I'm focusing on here. Um, uh, the, most fruits and vegetables, they can contain toxic we always think we need to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, but there are some toxic components in there that may be uh, less uh, beneficial for our health. And these can be removed or detoxified by the microorganisms during the fermentation process. Um, the, particularly the ones that we want to get rid of are the oxalate, the proteases, um, alpha amylase inhibitors, lectins, condensed tannins, and phytic acid, just for example. And they all contain the fruits and vegetables and they're some of the things we don't want to take in. Um, again, the products, fermentation, carbon dioxide, alcohol, and lactic acid, you've all heard of these this morning. I'm gonna go through that one. Um, but the biopreservation, the biopreservation is something that's really critically important to us at the, at the Department of Agriculture, so I do want to spend a little time on that. So as you can see, dairy products, fermented meat products, and then vegetable products. Um, the term biopreservation is used in a broader sense than just fermentation, because some biopreservative uh, microorganisms may not actually ferment the product, um, but they will, they will get rid of some of the pathological or path uh, pathogenic um, compounds or pathogenic bacteria or other organisms that are in there that you want to get rid of. So it's, it goes a bit further than just the traditional fermentation. You actually can get rid of some of the negative things out there. Um, the lactic acid producing bacteria are the ones that we traditionally think of as doing this, and they play a role in the, in the biopreservation and keeping the food safe, they, um, and, and in extending the shelf life, which is really, again, important for the ag community. Um, one of the things that they, they do um, is you can have is the barrier, uh, bactericidins, um, which are which can actually give a sort of an innate immunity to the food foodstuffs that we have. And they're ribosomal, ribosomally synthesized. Um, they're released in low molecular mass peptides, about 30 to 60 base pairs and uh, amino acids. And they have bactericidal um, properties, so they will destroy some of the negative things that we don't want to have on there. Um, the, 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 what we, as you heard this morning, What's really critical in all of this, and the reason we do a lot of this research, is you have to try to define what are the really positive effects of this process, and what are the negative effects, and what is it, and you have to get a really good balance between those two. Um, anyway, okay, again, another table we saw this morning. This is a condensed one, but it's been around. Fermenting fruits has been around for a tremendous amount of time. Um, I think as the world population expands, as we heard with the sustainability issues yesterday, that this is something that we're gonna to have to go to and utilize a lot more. Um, it's becoming a very important role in the preservation of fruits and vegetables. As you know, we've, we, as, you know, our dietary guidelines in the United States are telling people to eat a lot more fruits and vegetables. Those are also the, the products that are wasted or lost. And so we really have to work on being able to preserve those. 
We are working on increased production in the ag community, but we also know that if we could just decrease the waste and the food loss, we'd be about a third ahead of what we are now. So fermentation is gonna be a very important project as we move forward with the increasing population. Um, the most uh, reported fermented fruits and vegetables currently that we have are the root vegetables, cabbage, carrots, turnips, beetroots, radishes, uh, and sweet potatoes. Um, the vegetable fruits, cucumbers, olives, tomatoes, peppers, okra, and green peas. Uh, vegetable juices, um, carrot, turnip, tomato, pulp, onion, sweet potato, beet, and horseradish. And then fruits, apples, pears, uh, immature mangoes, immature palms, lemons, fruit pulps, and bananas and berries. So those were, if you look for them, those are the ones that are highly, uh, that are the largest number that's fermented these days. Again, the benefits of fermentation, um, having been in nutrition for quite a while, obviously I, I, I believe strongly in the enhancement of the nutrition, nutritional value of the foods, but then having moved into this more food safety and quality area, it's also to enhance the safety of the product as well. Uh, these are really important. Um, then again, the predominantly done by lactobacillus uh, fermentation, so we've heard a lot about that. I will move on, not go to my notes there. Um, they've been used for many, many years. Um, they enhance, you know, what we found with the lactobacillus fermentation of fruits and vegetables is they enhance the utilization of calcium, phosphorus, and iron, and actually enhance the uptake of iron and vitamin D, which is really important. So it's not just having a food product that has the component in it that you want to deliver for health outcomes, but it's making it bioavailable, which is really critical. Um, again, we face challenges with knowing how much to put in there, um, how much is safe, what's the most optimal amount. So even though I'm encouraging this, I'm also encouraging the fact that we need to do a significant amount of more research so that we know what we can put in there to keep folks safe. Um, Again, um, this is just a slide for this showing the transition of food through the human gut and where most of the thing, uh, most of the components of it are absorbed. Um, may, some of you may not be as old as I am, but when I took anatomy, um, and we, we didn't even look at the large intestine. That was just an area that everything just went through. But now we're finding out that it's actually critically important for the absorption of uh, short-chain fatty acids as well as some other products. So um, the this fermentation and the study of the microbiome is teaching us an awful lot about um, nutrient uptake and health. Um, trying to go quickly. Um, the effects of probiotics and yeast on the bacteria, as you see, there are several effects. It has an effects on the epithelium, on the mucosal immunity, and the effects on other bacteria. Um, I'm not gonna go into that. Tom may be doing some more of the mechanistic study, so I don't wanna talk about that. Um, but the challenges in developing the clinical recommendations for probiotics uh, and therapy, which many people are currently trying to do, is not a lack of the scientific literature. It's all over the place. If you do a, med if you do a search on this, it's everywhere. But the problem is that there's a lack of consolidated research and consistency across the various studies. So they're using different strains, different dosages, different time frames, different duration. It's very, very confusing right now. So we have to put a lot more of effort into the research to really standardize and get a better handle on these studies. Um, again, some of the effects of the um, microbial fermentation and what happens in the host, and I'm not gonna spend time on this because I'm gonna give time for Tom to go through these. Um, I, again, I'll skip through that one. So the functioning, functional fermentating foods research, which we're involved with, as you can see, the sources of probiotics that we've heard some about before listed there. Um, I'm from the ag department, so for us, uh, the, the best way to get your nutrients is from natural foods, um, not from pills. And actually, Sharon, um, great leaves have more resveratrol than, than the grapes themselves, though. So leaf green, leafy vegetables may be the way to get some more of your benefits, so. May not be as fun, <laughs> but anyway. 
Um, so we do not have term in the United States. The FDA does not recognize something called functional foods, although it's something that is recognized internationally in many other countries. It's just not a word that, that we use in terms of regulation. But we can start to think of some of these foods as functional foods because they're, they're relaying an increase in function, a gain um, for our health. Um, these are, the, these are such, just some of the sources of the prebiotics we have for fruits and vegetables. Um, again, as we are at expanding a population and, and creating a greater need for foods across the world, I think this is an area that we're really going to have to look into. And many of the, the, the benefits of this is the biopreservation, so even if you cannot produce you know, producing the food in the, in the region is the most important, but if you can't produce it there, you can have these biopreserved and be able to transport them and get to them to areas of where they're needed. Um, uh, the traditional ones that we know most about are the cabbages. Um, they allow uh, the, the uh, more bioavailability of the nutrients you want, such as vitamin C, um, vitamin A, um, these components, um, it's been shown that diets that are high in these have show lower lipids in the bloodstream, so it's uh, related to lower in cholesterol as well. Other beneficial, you've heard about the cancer and the, colon, the different cancer outcomes this morning. So they have a lot of benefit for health um, and, and nutrient delivery. Um, what we want are the good bacteria. Uh, again, it's going to be a balance, so we want to make sure we get the good guys, a higher level of good bacteria versus the low bacteria. And you can see the probiotic-rich foods that are up there. We heard about the dairy sources already. There's fruit and vegetable sources, soybeans, grains, um, non-dairy beverages, um, and then there's a list of the prebiotic foods. So these are the foods that you're going to feed to your commensal bacteria that you want to keep in your gut and keep motivated and keep staying there and doing what they're supposed to do. Um, again, in terms of fermenting foods, it's going to be, we think, a very, very strong candidate for biofortification and some alternative strategies for improving nutritional status around the world. Um, some of these, you know, they can go from anything to, you know, feeding, feeding the hungry to becoming real designer foods. Uh, and treating certain, uh, promoting health as much as possible and possibly treating disease as well. Again, one caveat, even though we're very excited and enthusiastic about this, more research has to be done because we have to make sure that this is safe and effective before we put it out there. And I'm going to stop here. So um, I will be happy to talk to people afterward. I know I went through this really quickly. Um, and I have data if anyone needs it, but I really wanted to make up time for this morning.